Good morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on when you're watching this. My name is Tim Osborne, and today we're going to continue discussing physics 114, uh, moving from Newton's laws towards impulse and momentum. So first, we're going to have to review some of Newton's laws just to make sure we have a firm understanding of them uh, before moving into new material in momentum and impulse. To start today, we're going to focus on this question. We have a box that is moving up along the incline as shown, and we want to know where is the acceleration pointing. So it looks like we have this person, looks like they're pulling a block up a ramp, and we want to know, based on that information, where is the acceleration pointing? So go ahead, pause this video, and answer this question on Gradescope. All right, now that we've had a chance to answer it on Gradescope, let's think, what are the things we need to know in order to determine the direction of acceleration? So first thing is to remember that acceleration is a vector, meaning it has a magnitude and a direction. And we define acceleration as the change in velocity. So given this question, we're just told that the box is moving up along the incline. We're not given much information about how its velocity is changing, if its velocity is changing, is it speeding up, is it slowing down? So because of that, we actually don't have enough information to talk about how its acceleration like, would point because of the fact that in order to know where the acceleration would point, we would need to know the, where and what ways the velocity is changing. For instance, if the person was pulling it up at a faster and faster and faster rate, we would say that our acceleration points up the ramp. If the person was maybe slowing down in how quickly they were pulling up uh, the block, then we would say the acceleration points down the ramp. But unfortunately, we don't know enough about the situation to actually make any comments on that. So next question. Which car would you rather be in during a head-on car crash? A, a car whose front hood region is made with a rigid steel, or B, a car whose front hood region is made of a lightweight plastic that deform easily, as shown in the picture on the right. So again, pause the video, take a second to answer this question on great scope. All right, now that we've had a chance uh, to answer this question on great scope, we can think a little bit about maybe some real world experience and try to figure out what an answer to this question would be. So we have the choices between the car with a steel rigid hood or a car with a lightweight plastic hood as shown on the right. So first thing that you might think about is, well, if the car on the right has that kind of lightweight plastic hood and it sustains such a, like what looks to be a pretty bad car accident, maybe I don't wanna be in that car. However, it's actually kind of counterintuitive. So there's a reason that cars are made out of those lightweight plastics in the front often, and it's because it's actually beneficial for the car to be able to deform easily in a car accident. If I have a rigid steel car and it can't deform, we're going to see a little bit later in this lecture about what that actually does um, to your body within the car. So for this case, it is better to be in car B, the lightweight easily deformable plastic is actually a safer like, situation to be in. So what is momentum? The product of a body's mass and velocity is called the body's linear momentum, or simply just momentum. And we denote that usually with a lowercase p. Um, so we have p equals m times v. And it's important to note, again, like acceleration, momentum is a vector quantity, meaning we have to, one, denote it with the vector symbol above p, but that also means that we need a direction, not just a magnitude when talking about momentum. So momentum also has the SI units of kilogram meters per second or Newton seconds. Um, but again, it's really, really important to remember that momentum is a vector and has a direction. Now, another thing that you can kind of relate this to is inertia. So when we talked about inertia being the, how a body wants to either stay in motion or stay not in motion, Momentum is kind of a way to explain that. If a very, very massive object is moving, even if it's not moving very quickly, it's very, very hard to stop because it has a lot of momentum because that mass times velocity is what gives us that momentum. Um, similarly, if we have a very, very massive object that isn't moving, it's stationary, we would have to do quite a bit of, we have to impart quite a large force to even get it to move a little bit because it has so much inertia um, and just requires so much uh, force to get it moving. So keeping going down this track, 
we want to express Newton's second law in terms of momentum. So Newton's second law, F equals MA. So we have F net equals mass times acceleration is equal to mass times the change in velocity over the change in time. Like we talked about before, acceleration and velocity are both vectors and acceleration is defined by the change in velocity over change in time. So now we know that the mass times the change in velocity is equal to our momentum. So now we can talk about force, not just in terms of mass and acceleration, but we can talk about it in a change in momentum over a change in time. So now we have two different ways of writing um, force. A more general form of Newton's second law is that F net is equal to d momentum dt. Now this is a derivative, so some of you might have seen this in a calculus course, or if you've taken uh, other physics courses before, you might have seen this kind of terminology. Um, but for us, what's more important is the change in momentum over the change in time. The dp dt being an infinitesimally small change in momentum over an infinitesimally small change in time, being our net force. So impulse and momentum. Now we want to express Newton's second law in terms of momentum kind of continuing. So the F net times the delta T is called the impulse. And we represent that by the symbol J. Again, it is a vector because force is a vector. So if we multiply a vector times a scalar, we're still going to have a vector. All we did to get to the situation is we started with F net equals delta P over delta T and multiplied both sides by delta T so that we now have F net times delta T is equal to delta momentum. Again, this is called impulse, and it is a vector, so we need to make sure that we uh, keep track of direction. An impulse imparted to an object causes a change in the object's momentum. So we can say that J equals delta P. Again, just like substituting in J for F net times delta T. To review, here are the three key ideas so far. We have momentum, which is a vector, and it's equal to mass times velocity. We have impulse, which is equal to the average force times the change in time. And we have the impulse momentum theorem, which is that J, impulse, is equal to the change in momentum. So again, car safety. We have a 1,500 kilogram car with a rigid front hood region that is traveling at 22.5 meters per second, approximately 50 miles per hour when it collides with a wall and comes to a complete stop. Since it is rigid, it comes to a full stop in 0.05 seconds. What is the average force the wall exerts on the car during the collision? So how we would do this is that we'd say, okay, well, J is our impulse. And that's our change in momentum. We, have, we know that J is equal to the average force times delta T, and that's equal to the change in momentum, which is M times velocity final minus M times velocity initial. Now we solve for F average. So we basically just divide both sides by delta T. So we have F average is equal to M times the quantity of velocity final minus velocity initial, all divided by delta T. Plugging in our numbers, we have the 1500 kilograms for the mass of the car, zero meters per second for our final velocity because we come to a complete stop, 22.5 meters per second as our initial velocity because that's how we were fast we were moving initially and 0 0.05 seconds for delta T, because that's the time over which this car takes to stop. And what we find is that this car would experience 675,000 newtons of force in the negative direction. What that means is that that force is applied opposite the direction of its motion. So if it's moving from left to right, that force must have been applied by the wall towards the left, basically to stop the car from moving. So that's a lot of force. That's a very, very large force. Now let's think about, okay, what if instead of having that rigid hood, we have a deformable hood? Like we said in that first or second question that we did today, um, where we have that car with these soft plastics making up the front. So again, we have a 1500 kilogram car with a deformable front hood and it's traveling at 22.5 meters per second when it collides with a wall and comes to a complete stop. Since it is deformable, it takes longer to come to a full stop. Now it takes about one full second as opposed to the 0.05 seconds for the rigid hood. What is the average force the wall exerts on the car during this collision? So you can think we're probably gonna follow the same basic steps that we did last time. We have J again equal delta P. J is 
F average times delta T and delta P is just mass times velocity final minus, time, minus mass times velocity initial. Again, we divide by delta T on both sides to end up with F average equals M times quantity VF minus VI all over delta T. And we plug in our numbers, 1500 kilograms for the mass, zero meters per second for our final velocity, 22.5 meters per second for our initial velocity, but now one second for the change in time. And what you can see is that now our force is 33,800 newtons. Again, still negative because we're still applying it to the left, like but the wall is still opposing the motion of the car. So it's still in the negative direction, but that's significantly less. That's almost 20 times less of an average force compared to the rigid hood. So you can just kind of imagine that if you're sitting in this car over that time, you're experiencing 1 20th of the force you were experiencing in the rigid car, which you could probably think about how that would feel if you're experiencing something that's 20 times the force of this accident. So now that we kind of have that set up, we're gonna do another problem. So we have two 1,000 kilogram cars. They're both traveling five meters per second when they crash into a wall. Car A is equipped with a spring bumper and rebounds with a speed of five meters per second, meaning it hits the wall and bounces backwards from the wall at a speed of five meters per second while car B crumples and does not rebound when it hits the wall. The collisions both take 0.5 seconds. So in both of these scenarios, the cars are taking the same amount of time for their collision. The difference is that car A has the spring bumper, meaning it bounces backwards with five meters per second. Car B does not have the spring bumper and it crumples so it doesn't rebound. So which car do you think is safer for the occupants? Go ahead and pause this video and answer on Gradescope. All right, so now that we've had a chance to answer on Gradescope, basically we wanna use all of the knowledge that we've had previously. And in this case, it's actually better, again, to be in the car that crumples. Now, we're gonna, on the next couple slides, we're going to kind of work through this together to talk about why that is. But you can probably think about um, things like the time it takes to crumple. Well, in this case, they're both the same. So what's different about car A and car B? So we're gonna be thinking about why the fact that car A bounces backwards with that five meters per second, why is that gonna be a problem for us if we're talking about which one is safer? So the first thing we're gonna do is figure out, well, what is the correct expression for the average force applied to the wall, by the wall to car A? So again, go ahead and pause this video and answer on Gradescope. Okay. So now that we've had a chance to answer on Gradescope, we wanna talk about again, what is that expression for F average? So remember the things that we need to include is that F average is always equal to the mass times the quantity of velocity final minus velocity initial, all divided by delta T. So for this situation, what is our initial velocity? Well, it's the five meters per second towards the wall. For car A, when we say what is the final velocity? Well, it didn't come to a complete stop, it bounced backwards at five meters per second. So its final velocity is now five meters per second, but in the negative direction compared to the initial velocity. And again, the time it takes for this collision is 0.5 seconds. So if we look at our options, the one that makes the most sense and is exactly what we said is option C. The mass is 1,000 kilograms. The final velocity is negative five meters per second. The initial velocity is five meters per second, and our change in time is 5.5 seconds. Now let's do the exact same thing for car B. Go ahead and pause this video and answer on Gradescope. Okay, so using the exact same kind of reasoning we did for car A, we wanna think about what about car B? So again, we still have the same 1,000 kilogram car, we still have the same 0.5 second collision time. We still have the same five meter per second initial velocity. Now the difference is that instead of having a final velocity that is in the opposite direction, car B crumpled and came to a complete stop, meaning its final velocity should be zero meters per second. So if you look at our options, the one that gives us the ability to have a final velocity of zero meters per second 
is option B. So in this case, option B is our correct response. 1,000 kilograms for the mass, zero meters per second for the final velocity, five meters per second for the initial velocity, and 0.5 seconds for the collision time. So now we're just gonna plug in those numbers and actually solve for them. And if we look, we see that the force on car A on average is 20,000 newtons, where the force on car B is 10,000 newtons. Meaning even moving at a relatively slow speed of five meters per second, we've doubled the force experienced because of that spring bumper. So you can imagine that if you're in both of these cars, it's going to feel very, very different to be in car A than it is to be in car B. And in some cases, it's definitely safer, or actually in all cases, it's safer to be in car B because you're experiencing a much smaller average force. So now we're gonna talk about force versus time diagrams. So I want you to recall that the area under the acceleration time graph gave us the change in velocity. So we have this graph here, we have acceleration on the y-axis in meters per second squared, and we have time on the x-axis. And if we had some graph of acceleration as a function of time, if we find the area under that curve or the area under that graph, we would find how much our velocity has changed. Now, there's a similar thing that we can do uh, with force and time graphs. So because we know that mass times acceleration is just force, if we multiply our y-axis by mass, we now have a force versus time graph. And now we can see that the area under the force time graph is actually our change in momentum. So again, we have force on the y-axis, we have time on the x-axis, we have some graph of force as a function of time, and finding the area under that graph or area under that curve gives us the change in momentum. So now we have again, J is equal to delta P is equal to F average times delta T. So impulse is equal to the change in momentum is equal to the average force times the change in time. So next classroom response question, suppose the brakes of your bicycle fail while you are going down the hill on MLK Boulevard and you must choose between crashing into either a haystack or a concrete wall. Which one of the following statements best justifies why hitting the haystack is a wiser choice than hitting a concrete wall? Go ahead and pause this question or pause the video and answer on Gradescope. Okay, so let's look at our options. We have option A that says the haystack gives you a smaller impulse than the concrete wall. We have B, the haystack changes your momentum over a longer time. We have C, your change of momentum is smaller if you hit the haystack than if you hit the concrete wall. So we need to think about what is impulse again? What is the change of momentum? And how are those two things related? So if I am, or if we're moving down this hill, and our brakes are out, we, we need to stop. We, we, we need to make sure that we are not moving anymore, uh, hopefully so we don't get hit by a car or anything like that. So regardless of which option we take, either the haystack or the concrete wall, we still need to come to a complete stop, meaning we need to go from our initial velocity to a final velocity of zero. So in either option, either the haystack or the concrete wall, we're gonna have the same change in momentum because we still need to stop. We need to go from having some initial momentum to having no momentum. So that kind of rules out C right away because it says your change in momentum is smaller if you hit the haystack. That's not true. If our change in momentum were smaller from the haystack, that would just mean we didn't fully stop and we would still have quite a problem on our hands. So now we're between options A and B. A says the haystack gives you a smaller impulse than a concrete wall. But what is impulse? Impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So if we know that the change in momentum in both of these options needs to be the same if we're to come to a complete stop, that would imply that the impulses also need to be the same. What could be different about those if we remember that impulse is equal, also equal to the average force times the change in time, that means in each of these scenarios, what's probably going to be different is what the average force we're experiencing and over what time we're experiencing that average force is. So A is incorrect because in both cases, the overall impulse needs to be the same because our change in momentum needs to be the same. 
So that kind of leaves us with option B, the haystack changes your momentum over a longer time. This is just like when we were talking about the car with the softer hood versus the car with the rigid hood. The softer hood car gives you time to basically crumple a little bit, slowing over how quickly you need to stop. So this haystack can kind of give a little bit. It can, it can kind of deform and you can squish into it without running like right into a rigid object, meaning you have a slightly longer time to change that momentum, meaning the average force you're going to experience is smaller than over this concrete wall, which I don't know if you've ever hit a concrete wall before, not very forgiving. You're not gonna be able to bend that concrete wall very much and you're probably just gonna kinda of hit it and stop very, very quickly, meaning you're going to experience a very, very large average force. So the reason we want to pick the haystack over the concrete wall is because we have more time to change our momentum, meaning we would have a smaller average force when we choose the haystack. So here's some graphs that we can look at. It's the same change of momentum, but very different average forces experienced. When we hit the concrete wall, we basically change our momentum in a very, very short time. Whereas when we hit the haystack, we have a much longer time. So as you can see on the left, we still need to have the same change of momentum. So the area under this curve needs to be the same. But if we're only using this little bit of time to slow down, the average force we're experiencing is very, very large compared to when we hit the haystack where we have all of this time to slow down because the haystack can deform and it can give us some room and some time, we don't need to experience quite as large or not nearly as large of an average force. So again, this is another way to look at a kind of a graphical interpretation of why it is much, much safer to hit the haystack in terms of uh, having a longer time and a smaller average force. So now collisions. The concept of momentum can be particularly useful when considering interactions, collisions and explosions, between two or more bodies. So imagine two astronauts interact with each other. Each exert a force on one another of equal magnitude, but opposite direction. Remember back to Newton's third law that two bodies interacting uh, must ex like have equal and opposite forces. Um, so there's no external forces acting on the two astronauts. The system is, uh, that we see in the system, so it's total momentum is conserved, meaning the only forces acting on the astronauts are the, two, the forces that they're imparting on one another. The forces the astronauts exert on each other form an action-reaction pair. So as you can see, uh, astronaut A pushes on astronaut B, astronaut B pushes on astronaut A, and they experience the same force, but in opposite directions. So the impulses are thus equal and opposite, Therefore, the change in momentum is equal and opposite for each astronaut. So if, again, that caption on the picture saying that no external forces act on the two astronauts, so its total momentum is conserved. Momentum is a conserved quantity, meaning we can use the fact that momentum needs to be the same before and after a collision to kind of give us some information about how that collision will play out in terms of what velocities different objects might have afterwards. So we consider the following analysis, that the force of B on A times the delta T, meaning how long that force is imparted, is equal to the change in momentum for astronaut A, and the force of astronaut A on B times delta T is equal to the change in momentum on astronaut B. We know that the force of astronaut A on B is equal and opposite to the force of astronaut B on A. We can say that the impulses, the F average of A on B times delta T is equal to the negative F of astronaut B on A times delta T, because again, we're just substituting in um, the FAB equals negative FBA. And now we can say that those two impulses must be equal to zero when we sum them. This again comes from the fact that momentum must be conserved, meaning the change in momentum of one must be exactly equal and opposite to the change in momentum of the other. So their impulses, the sum of their impulses, must equal zero as well. So now again, we have the delta, the change in momentum for astronaut A plus the change in momentum for astronaut B is equal to zero. Really, really important when you're doing these problems is to remember that momentum, again, is a vector, meaning its direction matters. If I'm moving towards some object and then moving away, 
my velocity is different in both of those situations, so my momentum will have different signs in both of those cases. So the change in momentum of the system is zero, again, because the system is conserving momentum. In other words, the total momentum is equal to the change in momentum for astronaut A plus the change in momentum for astronaut B. That's equal to zero. Uh, we can also say that it's equal to the final momentum minus the initial momentum. So delta P total is equal to final momentum minus initial momentum is equal to zero. And again, that tells us that the final momentum must be equal to the initial momentum because that quantity is conserved. So if the net force acting on a system of objects is zero, then the total momentum of the system is constant. Mathematically, if F net equals zero, then delta P total equals zero, which is the same as writing that P final equals P initial. So final classroom response question for the day. We have a glider A with mass MA moves towards glider B with mass MB, where mass A is less than mass B. Glider B is initially at rest. The gliders are equipped with magnets so that the gliders repel without touching. After the collision, glider A has reversed direction and glider B moves to the right. So we have these two options to kind of show us what's happening before the collision and what's happening after the collision. Is the magnitude of the final momentum of glider B greater than, less than, or equal to the final momentum of the system? So go ahead, pause this video, answer this question on Gradescope. Okay, so let's think about how we wanna talk about this problem now that you've got a chance to answer it on Gradescope. We want to know how the final momentum of block B compares with the final momentum of the entire system. So initially, all we have in that before collision diagram, you can see it here, is that we have block A moving with some velocity towards block B, which is stationary. So what we can do here is we can try to figure out what is the initial velocity of our system? Because we know that the initial velocity must be the same as the final velocity of our system, given the fact that these two scenarios are, uh, momentum is being conserved in them. So we know that our initial momentum is going to be the momentum of block A plus the momentum of block B initially. The initial momentum for block A is just mass A times velocity A. The initial momentum for block B is going to be mass B times, well, in this case, it's zero. Block B is not moving. So block B actually contributes nothing to the initial momentum. Now we look at after the collision. We now have block A moving to the left at some velocity A. We have block B moving to the right at some velocity BF, meaning the final velocity for block B. So we're trying to figure out, is that block B moving with a greater momentum than the total system? So another way we could think about this is, does the momentum that block B has in this frame after the collision, is it larger than what the total momentum was before the collision? That's kind of a weird question to think about at first, but we could just do it mathematically. Again, we could say, okay, we know that the initial was mass A times velocity AI. And we know that in collision, after the collision, we have now block A moving to the left, meaning block A is actually moving it with an opposite momentum as it had initially. The only way that can be true is if block B is moving with more momentum, has more momentum than the system did initially. Because if we were to add these two momentums together, what we'd actually be doing is that momentum B would be B times VB. Momentum A would be negative VA times mass A, because now the velocity is in the opposite direction. So the total momentum after the collision is MB VB final minus MA VA final. Whereas the total collision or the total momentum initially is just MA VA initial. 
So we know that those two quantities have to be equal to each other. And maybe it would help to kind of write some of this down if you're not doing so already, just so that you can kind of keep track of it. But we say that if we initially know that the momentum is MA VA initial, and that must be equal to the final momentum of MB VB final minus MA VA final, well, then that tells us that VB or M B VB final, the final momentum for just block B, is actually equal to the sum of MA VA initial plus MA VA final. So what that tells us is that block B or glider B actually has a greater momentum than the total momentum of the final system. And the reason that's true is because of the fact that block A or glider A is now moving to the left, its momentum is now negative. So the total momentum of the system is this quantity for A for block B minus the quantity for block A. So the total momentum remains conserved. This can be a little bit tricky, um, but it helps. It really helps to kind of write out um, what your initial momentum is for each system, and then write out what your initial momentum is for each piece within that system, and seeing how those things compare, knowing that the total momentum of the system before the collision and after the collision must be conserved. So again, based on that analysis, we see that glider B has a greater momentum than the final momentum of the system. So with that, that's what, all we have for today. Um, next time we're gonna actually be moving on to a different topic, talking about stress and strain. Um, but like I said, for this topic, it really, really helps to make sure that you're careful with how you're writing um, your kind of steps of your equations and make sure again, you remember that momentum is a vector meaning the direction in which I move matters a lot in determining um, what my momentum actually is. All right.